I decided to just go with a simple title this time because I've been, this is something I've been talking about for a while. And I, I was surprised, quite surprised really, earlier this year that Wall Street just could not get off the whole, you know, Powell put as an extension of the Greenspan put, the Bernanke put, the Yellen put, even though he said over and over and over again, there is no put this time because, you know, they've got a dual mandate and the, the full employment thing they're not having a problem with because employment's sitting below 4%, unemployment's below 4% in the U.S. Right now, they're focused on the other half of their mandate, which, of course, is price control, which obviously so far this year, year they're doing a pretty shitty job of. And the FOMC is being very blunt in saying, you know, they're, you know, they're basically saying we're going to go at least to neutral rates, probably beyond. Neutral rates are a guess, quite honestly, but the sort of the consensus guess of neutral rates is two and a half to three percent. If inflation doesn't start coming off very fast, like very fast from here, <clears throat> I'm thinking now they're probably going to have to go to four percent, give or take. Um, if you look at what happened on Friday, um, obviously yesterday was uh, interesting. Um, <laughs> people did not like the uh, CPI print. I wasn't surprised by it. I, I thought we might get a bit of a break uh, with base effects with the year over year. Uh, the base effects don't really impact month over month, and as it turns out, we didn't get a break on either of them. I mean, I wasn't that shocked given food prices and energy prices, but even the core, we just didn't see a pullback in. And I think that's what really surprised people. The consumer sentiment that came out later was horrible, but I'm, I've always been someone who's a bit leery about reading too much into that. I've never found it to be a great indicator, though I have to admit the readings yesterday were so bad that you got to think at some point that's going to start impacting behavior. People are just going to start buying less stuff. But so far it hasn't. I mean, one of the things that surprised me, and I suspect Jay Powell in the last two months, is you really haven't seen a decrease in consumer spending. That doesn't mean it's not going to happen. It just hasn't happened yet. And I, I think I know why that is. I'm going to go into that here in a second. You know, basically, you know, I said a month ago when, when it started bouncing, you know, I, I told I told subscribers, look, I, I just I think this is a bear market rally. Um, I, I, I don't see how we get out of this without lower lows. My opinion hasn't changed. I mean, yesterday we literally closed. I think the SPX literally closed exactly where it closed a month ago on the low. Um, granted, there was an intraday low a lot lower than that that day. Uh, and we didn't get to that, thankfully. But uh, I still think before, probably before the, this summer's out, we see lower lows. I don't think I don't think this bear market's done. I think it's got at least another 10 or 15 percent to go. Uh, you know, we're all going to have to be paying attention Wednesday. That's the uh, next FOMC announcement after the Tuesday Wednesday meeting. People are going to be looking really, really hard at the dot plots. They're going to be looking really, really hard at the transcript and what he says exactly when he's answering during the Q&A session. Everybody's going to be trying to find out how aggressive he is. I mean, he's been saying for three months he's going to be hawkish. You know, the vice chair, Larry Brainon, has been saying for three months he's going to be hawkish. Virtually all of the other members are saying we're going to be hawkish, but for some reason Wall Street keeps going, oh, they don't really mean it. Um, they, they mean it this time. Uh, I don't think there's a put. That's simply not what they're worried about. You know, if, if uh, Wall Street dropped 80 percent, yeah, everybody would be worried. But if it drops another 10 percent, 15 percent, I don't think that's going to do it. They're more worried about inflation. So, if, if, you know, if you're if you're thinking the Fed's going to come to the rescue here, two or three hundred points lower, uh, I don't think that's going to happen personally. So we all got to be prepared for lower lows before this is over. And I brought this chart up because the monthly and, and note this is core CPI readings and it's monthly change from the previous month. And the reason I'm using this one is I was actually expecting a bigger impact from base effects. If you go back about a year, that's when you had the first step of inflation where it went from 2% to 4 or 5 and that was the first, that was, that's when everybody first started freaking out. Just because of the way the math works, you should get a drop off in the year over year because the base is higher, so the difference is smaller, even though the actual number is, is still maybe the same. Month over month, kind of gets you away from the whole base effects problem. And if you take a look at this chart, I mean, honestly, I, I don't see how you look at this chart and say to yourself, yeah, this is a, uh, oops, you know, 
you know, what trend is that? That's an up I don't see how anybody looks at that and sees anything but an uptrend. And I'm not saying this month wasn't the top. Maybe it was. I'm, ju I'm just saying uh, anybody who's thinking that inflation is going to be back to the 2 to 3% level that the bond market was pricing in a month ago is delusional, I think. Um, and no, this is core. This does not include food and energy. It's significantly worse <laughs> if you include food and energy. So this is core, and it's month over month. And we're clearly still in an uptrend here. So we're going to have to see this roll over, I think, before the Fed stop pushing. And it, it simply has not rolled over yet. That's just how it is. Why does the Fed care? This is really, you know, all the macro stuff aside, this is why the Fed cares, why any central bank cares about inflation as a problem. If you look at the right side of this chart, what this is is this is basically real weekly earnings. In other words, inflation-adjusted earnings for the average employee in the U.S. If you look at what happens when you go into an inflationary period, this is what happens. They never really get wage increases that match inflation when you're in a rising inflation environment. It just doesn't happen. So right now, you're at about negative 3.5 percent. That means people are losing 3.5 percent of their purchasing power. Basically, is going out the window because of inflation. And if inflation even stays at these levels, you'll probably see those numbers get worse. And what that means, really, that kind of an inflationary environment where where wages can't catch up, basically at some point a recession is baked in the cake. You, you just simply you will run into a, a, an area where consumers will hit the wall, they'll stop buying stuff. All of the advanced economies are consumer-driven economies. They stop spending, that's all she wrote, it's a recession, it's that simple. He knows that, so he's got to try to get ahead of it. And, you know, when, when I was sort of I was a little confused, honestly, that we didn't see consumer spending retail sales fall off, you know, in the last couple of months. Not hugely, but just some kind of a drop, and there really hasn't been one at all. And I, I really, that really had me scratching my head for a while, but this is really the reason for it. If you look at this red line, that's the U.S. savings rate, and you see those three spikes, those are the pandemic checks. So everybody got their bank account refilled three times during that period. A lot of them wisely, I think, used it to pay down revolving credit, which is essentially credit cards. But as you can see, the outstanding credit card debt has climbed right back up again, and it's just past the pre-pandemic peak. And you can see that the savings rate's gone from, I mean, it was like 30% or something silly right when those checks were going out. But let's, let's say it got up to 20, just to use an average. It's back down to about 3.5%, and it's still dropping. So it's, it's actually below... The savings rate's below where it was pre-pandemic. And what that means is consumers spending at the level they're spending it right now, they're going to they're run out of gas. And is that going to be two months, three months, six months? I'm not sure, but it looks to me like it's coming fairly fast. So I think we probably will see consumer spending and retail sales start falling off here pretty soon, you know, in the next month or two probably. And... Again, this is another thing, you know, this number came out yesterday too, and this is the other thing that kind of freaked out the market and probably gave us a second leg down. And that, that's the consumer sentiment survey, which is terrible. I mean, it's, it's really bad. Um, I'm honestly surprised, you know, I've been kind of cynical about the market all year, and I'm surprised how bad this number is. And I'm not honestly entirely sure why it's this bad. I, I got to assume it's inflation. That's, that's what's spooking consumers. I don't know what else it would be. I mean, unemployment rate's low. You know, wages aren't keeping up with inflation, but they are, they are rising. Um, you know, economic growth is fine. You know, most of the pandemic restrictions are gone. People can run around and see their family and stuff. So, I mean, the only obvious reason why it's as bad is inflation. So I'm, I'm assuming that is what's driving the sentiment. It has not yet driven spending, but this is why I'm leery about things really slowing down now. I see the combination of the previous slide and this one, and it just feels to me like I think we're going to see spending slow down. But, you know, that's, that's the only thing I've got. Uh, one thing that I think probably, one thing, and it's part of the inflation story that's affecting it is gasoline prices have gone up so much, and that's a very visible price for most, you know, North Americans more than Europeans, with, and Americans definitely, like we all fill our tank a lot, and it's, it's had some of the biggest increases and it's, it's real money. I mean, if you're, you look at the average wage earner costing 40 or 50 bucks more to fill your tank, that is not small potatoes. I mean, that's, that's a pretty big problem. It comes right out of discretionary income. 
So, <coughs> and I don't see any obvious reason to think oil prices are going to pull back significantly unless we get a demand shock, and a demand shock basically means a recession. So on, on the supply side, it doesn't seem like anything that's happened so far is working very well. So I don't have any expectation we're going to see lower oil prices unless the economy really slows down. So, you know, the question, of course, is how much worse can it get <laughs> after everybody getting the crap scared out of them yesterday? Uh, if you look at this chart, this is a 12-month forward uh, interest rate chart. So this is, this is, uh, this is a trade bond traders use to guess where they think interest rates are going to be a year from now. As you can see, there was a big spike right at the end yesterday, and that's, of course, part of the reason why the markets all got dumped. But it's sitting now at like 3.4, 3.5. That really should account for, and it does account for, all of the Fed fund increases that we think right now the Fed is going to do, the stuff they've been talking about. If you tack all that on, you come in a little bit under three and a half. So effectively, the bond market has priced all of that in, everything at least as of today. Uh, so that might be high enough. That in itself might give us a little bit of relief once things calm down a bit going forward. The, the real question is, what does inflation do the next two or three months, and how hawkish does the FOMC sound next week and July and a month after? I think, I think it's sort of baked in the cake now. I mean, Wall Street until last week was saying 250-point increases, then there's going to be a big wait. Um, definitely 250-point increases. I think there's a small chance of a 75, but I doubt it. I, I don't think the Fed really wants to surprise the market. But I think there's a fairly good chance, unless inflation is really pulled back by the end of August, we see another 50 and another 50 and another 50 until it's enough. So I think, you know, this thing could go higher than this. I'm personally thinking in terms of 4% terminal rate, so say, you know, two or three 25 basis point increases higher than that within the next year. I don't think the market's ready for that, unfortunately. <laughs> I guess we'll find out. The market's ready for what the Fed is talking about right now. It's not really ready for more rate increases. <clears throat> and honestly, the other thing I don't think the market has priced in is, you know, if we do roll over and we get the very slow growth, like they get lucky and they, and they manage to engineer a soft landing or we get a, even a mild recession, Wall Street hasn't really priced in either the decrease in earnings you would get in that kind of a scenario. And it, to me, it doesn't feel like they've really priced in the margin compression that you get in inflationary periods either. So. Um, I, you know, I, I wouldn't count on a lot of love from Wall Street for the next few months. I guess that's where I'm going. And, you know, what about gold? What about the stuff we care about? You know, if you look at this chart, <clears throat> you say to yourself, well, that doesn't look that great. I mean, it had this big spike and came all the way back. We're sitting around 1850, 1875. When you look at what gold trades against, gold's actually traded really well this year. I know it doesn't feel that way. <laughs> I know it doesn't look that way in my brokerage account, but... The truth of the matter is, if you look at what interest rates have done, and they've gone from being very large negative real rates to moderate positive real rates in the space of like three months. I mean, rates, real rates really, really took off in the last three months. And the U.S. dollar has been a beast all year. Yeah, it's had a little pullback the last couple of weeks, but until then it was nothing but up. And really against that backdrop, it's impressive how well gold did. Um, I'm very interested, obviously, to see whether what happened yesterday is the start of a new trend. This is something I talked to subscribers about a while back. Um, and this, it's going to be hard. It'll be hard to read these performance <laughs> charts, unfortunately. Um, there's two performance charts here. The top one, this one here is basically from middle of 2000, uh, middle of 2008, I think it was, into 2009. Basically, this is right here is in, this is when the shit really hit the fan, basically. This was Lehman, all that stuff. We see the S&P really diving here. Interestingly enough, gold sort of separated there, kind of went sideways, but then, and it's understated on a performance chart, but basically gold had a, a rally for like three years coming out of that. It took another six months before the S&P bottom. <coughs> it's not that dissimilar to what happened in 2001-2002. Are we, are we getting close to that again? I am expecting something like that again this time. It's very hard to, it's hard to see, but if you look at the right side of this chart, which is basically the last month or so, you are, you are starting to see divergence. I mean, gold was kind of underperforming the S&P really from the, middle of, from the middle of last year, obviously, where it topped out until about three months ago. It was kind of flat for a couple of months, and now 
you're seeing the red line and the blue line get farther apart. In other words, gold is starting to outperform. I am expecting a similar, you know, I don't know if it's going to be a three-year rally, but I'm expecting a similar kind of rally coming out of this situation. We're not out of it yet. Whether that 18, or whether the 1785 low we saw last month is Z-low, it's probably going to depend on how fast Wall Street bottoms and how fast the equity markets bottom. I mean, sometimes this stuff gets dragged out for a really long time, but I, I don't know. My gut feeling is this one isn't going to take long. If there's going to be another dump or another 10 or 15%, I don't think we're going to be waiting six or eight months for it to happen. I think it'll probably happen in the next, it'll probably happen during the summer, would be my guess, which is unusual. That's not what you expect in equity markets, but nothing about this cycle is normal, so I see no reason why that should be either. And this is sort of a, this is kind of an interesting chart I pulled off of Bloomberg. Because remember, I'm talking about gold diverging a few months ahead of the bottom in a bear market. This, this chart here is a chart that goes back basically to the mid-90s. And the comparison they're making is the dot-com bubble, which is this. There was about a 45% drawdown over, it was about two and a half years. This time around, we're already at 40% and we're like 12 months into it. This, you know, people feel like it's falling faster this time. They're not imagining it. It actually is falling faster this time. It appears that this cycle is, is quite compressed, say, compared to the dot-com cycle. So even though I don't think it would be that hard to make an argument that there's a bit more valuation drop to go, say, on, especially on things like tech stocks, it, it may be that the bottom comes faster than you would normally expect in a bear market. If that's the case, then my fantasy argument about about gold coming out first, you know, that might have been last month. I mean, I'm like most people, I'm expecting if there's going to be a bottom, it's in, you know, it's in Q3, September, October, when you usually see these things. Um, but I, this cycle is not like, it really is different this time, and I hate even saying that, but, but it really is different. Like the whole macro backdrop is so different from a normal cycle that I'm not, you know, I'm not betting too heavily on any outcome right now. Uh, except that I do think we're going to see a lower low, but outside of that, you know, it's flip a coin stuff. It could go either way, but my, my gut feeling is if the market's going to get shocked into thinking, oh my God, the Fed's going to go that far, and everybody shits the bed and just sells stuff, I'd suspect it doesn't take that long for that to happen, and we'll all know it if it happens, obviously. I think we've, I think we've all been around long enough to see uh, capitulation parts of the cycle are usually pretty obvious, and I don't feel like we've seen it yet. Um, Friday was, Friday was sort of in the ballpark, but that, even that wasn't capitulation. I mean, capitulation is usually worse than that. You see six, seven, eight percent in one day, and you see like 95, 98 percent selling volume, no buying volume. That's when it bounces. So what about base metals? Does that mean we should all run away and just ignore all these guys that I'm going to bring up on stage? No. I put up four charts here, and I did, I'm, instead of putting up four price charts, I put up four inventory charts. These are warehouse inventories for copper, nickel, zinc, and aluminum. And one thing that I find very interesting, uh, and it's a big part of the story of the 2020s, I think, is that even if, even if we're at the, near the end of a cycle, and I, don't even, I really don't even know whether pandemic to this, if you could even reasonably call it a cycle, but I, it's the word everyone uses, so let's use it, I guess. This is not what you would expect inventory levels to look like for base metals at the end of a, at a, end of a growth cycle. They start ramping up, and that's why base metals tend to roll over so hard. They haven't ramped up this time. I don't have any great expectation they're going to for a couple of reasons. One is there's just not a lot coming on stream, and there's not a lot coming on stream anytime soon, for that matter. The other thing is, and I don't know how much of a factor this is going to be, but China's been totally out of the picture this year because of lockdowns. There's, really, they really haven't been taking down much of anything in terms of imports of metals, even finished ones. Nothing like a normal year for them. I don't know what the second half of this year looks like. I mean, I assume at some point they're going to give up on these lockdowns because they don't seem to work. And the, the, the whole thing seems ridiculous. But I'm assuming at some point in the, in the near future they've cut back on that. They might be doing that into slowing G8 economy, G7 economies which would be unfortunate, but even so, I think you're going to see a bit more demand out of China. I don't think you need a huge amount of marginal demand. And medium long term, I'm, I'm very bullish on base metals because I think what we're seeing this year, you know, the war in the Ukraine, problems with Russia and Putin being an asshole, and energy prices, 
that's not going to dissuade anybody, especially in, like in the EU. They're not going to push less on, on the green agenda. They're going to push way harder because they want to get off of that stuff. So that means the demand growth for really uh, almost any metal, really, take your pick. I mean, all of these things get used heavily for all this stuff. Copper does, nickel stuff does, even, even uh, um, zinc does. <clears throat> Aluminum is one where it, it has, doesn't have much supply growth, and you could, get, you could get more demand growth. I mean, if copper prices go high enough, and I'm one of those guys that thinks before this decade's over, you know, seven, eight, ten buck copper won't, won't surprise me. Um, that's where it should go if the trends are right. Uh, you'll probably see some aluminum substitution. Uh, it's not great, but you can use it for some of the some of the wiring applications. So even aluminum probably isn't going to give you much of a break. I think we're going to see good metal prices for all of this stuff. It's just we got to live with the fact it's going to be it's going to be bumpy in the in the in the near term. And like I said, how bumpy that is, it really depends on whether China really ramps up. They have they haven't really done anything to ramp stimulus yet, but. They may do it because things things look pretty nasty over there. So I wouldn't be surprised if they do what they did the last couple of cycles and really ramp the internal stimulus, and that could be a that could be a big a big cushion for base metals. Um, I mean that's I mean that's pretty much it. You know the markets the markets are taking the Fed seriously. That's the bad news because I think the Fed is serious. So like I said, I I do think we see a lower low. I don't I don't think last month's lows were the lows. I, I think another ten or fifteen percent probably. Uh, you know, we're still not seeing readings weaken much, but for the reasons I pointed out with the consumer spending, I think they will. And ironically, if they don't weaken much, that doesn't improve the case as far as the Fed goes. It makes it worse. It's more likely they'll be more hawkish, not less. I mean, they, you know, they, they don't really want to come right out and say it, but, they, but they've pretty much said for the last two months, look, we've got 4% unemployment. That means we've got a cushion. And when a Fed governor says we have 4% unemployment and that means we have a cushion. What the Fed governor is saying is, I'm going to be trying to push the economy um, to the edge of it, but hopefully not into a recession to generate some de some uh, demand decline. That that's what they're saying. They're not going to say, oh yeah, we're going to try to create a recession. Um, they're trying not to, obviously, but they're going to try to get damn close because that's how they generate the demand destruction. That's really based on what we've seen so far in the last nine months. I don't see any other way you're going to see inflation come off other than some demand destruction. So. I think we have to assume if we're not going to see a recession, it's going to be close enough that it won't make any difference to us at a practical level. Wall Street's finally getting a little more realistic. I mean, I think they're kind of in the right place now, at least in terms of what the Fed's already said they were going to do. But like I said a bit earlier, I don't really, it doesn't feel to me like they've really priced in the earnings impacts you're going to have, even of a flat growth, much less a recession. And I definitely don't think they're really pricing in the compression in margins that are in an inevitability in an inflationary period where your your costs are growing faster than you can pass them on with prices. So, you know, for all of those reasons, that's just another reason why I think we probably get another 10 or 15 percent, possibly more, but probably 10 or 15 percent anyway to go on Wall Street. You know, gold, I'm, I'm hoping 1785 is the bottom. I mean, obviously, if we get a really, really ugly drawdown where Wall Street drops another 20 percent, and the babies are getting thrown with the bathwater, and people are selling everything, or they're selling what they can. Then, yeah, gold maybe gets whacked down again. But I, I think we're, I think we're pretty close to, and might be at the inflection point where we see the, the divergence between equities and the gold price. And gold should, you know, gold stocks are still stocks, so that doesn't, you know, things are still going to be rocky for them. But obviously, if we have seen that divergence, uh, it should bring some buying in on the stock side. I wouldn't expect any magic until Wall Street bottoms, but there you go. And longer term, I'm, I'm super bullish on base metals. I'm pretty bullish on gold and silver too, but base metals, I, I think there's a good chance that the 2020s are like the 1970s. I mean, really what created the situation isn't really the same as the 1970s, so I don't like leaning on that analogy. But we could see a situation like the 70s where the Fed doesn't quite pull it off when it comes to stamping out inflation and you get a bunch of these short cycles where you have three or four very mild recessions, which is kind of what happened in the U.S. where they kept trying to stamp out inflation. The good news is the 1970s was a great decade for commodities and a great decade for gold, and I suspect the 2020s are going to be the same. And that's all I got to say.